Noon, everyone, and thank you for zooming in today. It's great to have you with us. I am Ruth Katz, co-director of Aspen Ideas Health and executive director of the Health Medicine and Society program here at the Aspen Institute. I'm delighted to welcome you to another of our Aspen Ideas Health 2020 virtual events. Now, we couldn't be more excited about today's program, so let me jump right in with the introduction of our two very special guests. Diane Rehm is the host of, of the podcast, On My Mind. For 37 years, she hosted the Diane Rehm Show on NPR, where actually she began as a volunteer. Diane is also the author of four autobiographical books, including her most recent, When My Time Comes, conversations about whether those who are dying should have the right to determine when life should end. A director emerita of the Penn Faulkner Foundation, Diane is the recipient of numerous awards, including the National Humanities Medal and a personal Peabody Award, and has been voted among Washingtonians Magazine's 100 Most Powerful Women. Diane will be in conversation with Adrian Brodeur, one of the Aspen Institute's very own authors and executive director of the Institute's Aspen Words program. Adrian is the author of the memoir, Wild Game, which was named the best book for 2020 by NPR. Amazon, Slate, BuzzFeed, as well as the Washington Post. She founded a literary magazine with filmmaker Francis Ford Coppola and has served as a judge for the National Book Award. Adrian's essays have appeared in Glamour, O Magazine, The New York Times, Vogue, and many, many other publications. And she is, of course, a wonderful Aspen colleague. This is indeed, I think you will all agree, an all-star lineup. And we want to thank both Diane and Adrian for taking time from their incredibly busy schedules to join us today for what promises to be an extraordinary discussion. With that, our thanks again to Diane and Adrian, and of course to all of you in the audience for being with us today. We look forward to seeing you soon for our next Aspen Ideas Health event. Adrian, the stage is yours. Thank you thank again. You. Thank you so much, Ruth. And Diane, thank you for being here, and thank you for writing and sharing When My Time Comes. It is such an important and provocative and empowering book, which, as Ruth said, it addresses uh, the Right to Die movement, of which you are, of course, an inspiring champion. And I understand that the book started as a documentary, is that correct? Absolutely, and the documentary I have been working on for the past three years. And in the midst of working on it, I realized that I wanted to have a book to go right along with it. The book was published in February of this year. The documentary will be shown on public television in April of 2021. Well, that is something to look forward to. Thank and you. I know <laughs> that the medical aid in dying is a very personal issue for you. And can you tell us a bit about the experiences you've had with end of life care? Well, the first and really most powerful memory I have is of uh, my mother at age 49 begging to die as she lay in the hospital. Uh, she had a liver disease that was not treatable, and yet the doctors kept trying one thing after another. And on the last day that I was there with her. She begged to die. She just begged to die. She was in such pain that could not be addressed by anything that the doctors were doing. When she finally died on New Year's Day of 1956, 
She was 49, I was 19. I got to the hospital 20 minutes too late, which just broke my heart. And my father died of a broken heart 11 months later. So that sort of set the stage of my thinking about the right to die without even realizing it, Adrian. When my husband of 54 years developed Parkinson's disease, he and I had spoken a lot about what we wanted what each of us wanted at the end of life. And that was in no way to linger, in no way to go through a long suffering experience, either for ourselves or our children. And so when the time came, when he could no longer feed himself, stand on his own, bathe himself, do anything for himself. He told his doctor he was ready to die. He was in a nursing home in Maryland, which had and still has no right to die law. And so John Rehm chose to starve himself to death. He took no water, no food, no medication for 10 days. And finally, he was gone when I left, having spent the night at the home with my little dog on my stomach. I went home to feed the dog, and I got a call as soon as I came home and rushed back and my husband was gone. I got there 20 minutes too late. So the idea of wanting to have that right to die, to make that choice and to have loved ones beside me when my time comes is something that clearly motivates me now. Right, and it seems, although, you know, it, you missed both of the deaths by 20 minutes, as you, as you just said, and that sounds so sad, one of the big differences between your experience with your mother and with your husband is you did get to have those conversations. And it seems to me that talking about death is so uncomfortable and difficult for so many of us, and yet possibly it doesn't have to be. And one of the things that I'd be curious to hear about is if you have suggestions or recommendations for how people can begin to normalize these conversations. So maybe you can even tell us a little bit about what you've been able to communicate with your own family. Adrian, you're so right. Uh, the idea of talking about death is something that seems as though it's so difficult because people, when they are in the throes of good health and enjoying life and are younger, believe that death is something not to even be thought of. When I spoke at a church in Massachusetts with about 300 people in the pews, I said to them, please raise your hand if you have no plans to die. And of course, everybody giggled uncomfortably right. because they did not want to think about dying. My own thought is that if you have a parent who is ill, if you yourself are ill and wish to talk with your children, 
I think the way to begin a conversation with an older parent is to talk about yourself and whether, I mean, I think if my mother were still alive, I would say, Mom, you know, I've been thinking an awful lot about my own life and what I would want for myself at the end of my life. I would want my family with me. I'd want to be in my own home, in my own bed. I wonder if you thought about that at all. I mean, it, it's a way to perhaps open a conversation that's not just one conversation, Adrian. It's many conversations and could take place over a series of weeks or even months. Right. I mean, it just makes so much sense because I, I you know, there's absolutely no way we can expect our end of life wishes to be met <laughs> if we're unable to to have these conversations. In the, in the book, you talk about um, something called death cafes. Could you tell us what these are? I first heard about death cafes when I was on my last book tour a few years ago when I was in Indianapolis. I had never heard of death cafes, but what I was told at this wonderful gathering was that neighbors had decided to get together so that they and their neighbors could share what it was they wanted so that the entire neighborhood would know what their wishes were and they would gather for potluck suppers, they would gather for ice cream and cookies, you know, it just depended on what the convenience was. And now there are churches all over the country. The process actually began in England and then came here to the United States so that there are now death cafes all around the country, many begun in church groups, many in neighborhoods, many just bringing together people who've never met before, but who wish to talk about what they'd like at the end of life. That's fascinating. Well, so you are clearly in favor of medical aid in dying. And one of the things that I just admired so much about your book was how balanced it was. I mean, there are plenty of people who oppose medical aid in dying and you give them voice in these pages, which I assume you do in the documentary as Absolutely. well. Like, and I, I was surprised by frankly how provocative some of their arguments um, or some of their perspectives were. And I was wondering what you felt like you learned from talking to them and did they change your view at all? Um, I think I understood more deeply the conviction <clears throat> both from a religious point of view and from an ethical point of view um, how deeply felt those convictions are. Also, from a medical point of view, a doctor who believes that there can always be something more that can be done. A doctor who says, I never say to a patient, there's nothing more I can do. And yet, on the other hand, a doctor who will frankly say to a patient, you know, perhaps it's time to come to grips with the fact that anything more I can do may take away from the quality of life you have before you. 
I spoke with a priest who believes so strongly that God should be the only decider. And frankly, I can support that idea totally. I can support the idea that if you want everything that medical science can offer, I support you. If you want God to be the only decider, I support you. And if you want medical aid in dying, I hope you will support me as well. Absolutely. Um, so I happen to live in Massachusetts where I understand we might be voting on this issue soon. Yes. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the status of medical aid in dying laws across the U.S. and what, what legalization actually means for patients. I testified um, last year before the Massachusetts House of Delegates on this issue. Um, there are currently nine states plus the District of Columbia, where medical aid in dying is legal. You will have to go through a great many hoops before you get there, before that doctor that you are working with, and many will not work with you. Um, before you can get that doctor to prescribe the medication that will end your life when you decide the time has come. You must be diagnosed by two physicians to be within six months of death. That means, for the most part, that cancer patients uh, patients with fatal diseases, um, patients who have talked with and in some cases been psychiatrically examined by a specialist must say on their own and must be able to deliver on their own that medication to themselves. Um, in many instances, for example, with patients who have ALS and cannot hold that glass with the substance in it, there are now other ways in which that patient can help to deliver that medication. But there are so many safeguards in place, Adrian, to ensure that no force can be employed against that patient. No relatives can be there with that conversation that goes on between the doctor and the patient to ensure that there is no pressure taking place. And now in more than 22 years that Oregon, the first state to bring in medical aid in dying laws, there have been no complaints or lawsuits brought claiming that a patient has been pressured. So the law seems to be working well. That's an extraordinary statistic, that amount of time. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our audience Q&A soon, but I wanted to ask you one final question, which is a question you asked so many people in the book. Namely, Diane, what is your idea of a good death? A good death for me will be one 
when I have talked with my family, with my husband, my children, my grandchildren, about the current state of my health. If I am no longer able to care for myself on my own, if I am no longer able to be of service in any way, I wish to have my family, my dear friends here in my apartment to say our farewells. And when the time is right, to go into my bedroom, into my own bed with my husband, my children, my grandchildren, take the medication, kiss them all, and say how much I love them, and goodbye. That, for me, is a good death. Thank you for that. Um, Okay, I'm gonna switch over and now read you some of the questions from our audience. Um, the first question is, why do you think right to die policies are so controversial in the United States as opposed to some other countries? Other countries have, as our listener refers to, gone far ahead and in Places like Switzerland, for example, euthanasia is allowed. In the Netherlands, euthanasia is allowed. I think our country is far, far from that point, if it will ever be at that point. Many people have asked why we do not include dementia or Alzheimer's among those who can ask for or plan for medical aid in dying. And one woman, a DC council member, told me it's one step too far, that the country is simply not there yet. We've gone as far as we can go. We hope more states will join us. There are at least 20 states, including New York currently, and Massachusetts, where you are, Adrian, currently considering these laws. Right, right. Okay, I'm gonna look at the next question. Diane, do you have advice for family members who for how to cope with the loss of a loved one who chooses medical aid in dying and who might die sooner than they otherwise, than they would have otherwise, even though they know their family members aren't in pain anymore. Um, Did I read that correctly? I'm sorry. Do you have any advice for family members for how to cope with the loss of a loved one who chooses medical aid in dying and who might die sooner than they would have otherwise, even though they know their family members aren't in pain anymore. So I guess it's really, you, are you following the question? Uh, well, what I take from that question is that family members may not all be in agreement with the patient's choice. And the only thing I can say is that each of us has a life to live. And each of us, I believe, should have that choice in the end, hoping to help the rest of the family understand. It's a difficult situation, um, but in the end, I do believe the patient chooses when enough is enough. Yes. All right, we have time for one more question from, the, from our viewers. Um, do you think that a primary reason right to die is not universally embraced 
is economic because the medical establishment makes so much money during the last few weeks and months of life. Without uh, placing blame, I will acknowledge that in those last few months of life, we spend more money on a patient than at any other time of life, barring a very serious illness from childhood on up. I think many of the doctors I spoke with simply do not believe that they wish to be involved with helping a patient die. Their goal is to keep that patient alive and therefore I'm not placing blame on anyone for their ethical or moral or religious beliefs, but rather trying to encourage doctors to understand that it is we, the patients, who ultimately should have the choice about when to end our lives and making those guarded, safeguarded requests should be honored. If you cannot find a doctor who will honor your request, keep looking. I did, and I found one. And, and do you think doctors are becoming more open? I mean, is there some more training around this issue and area? It's the younger doctors who are hearing in ways that older doctors with older training cannot hear. I attended a lecture to young about to be physicians, some of whom, when they began hearing the lecture, had a quizzical look on their faces. Mm -hmm. But by the end of the lecture, when I interviewed them, they totally got it. So I think the younger doctors, in the same way the young people who are out marching in the streets today are changing things. I think these younger people all over will change our world mm -hmm. and change our attitudes about medical aid in dying. Well, that is actually such a hopeful and inspiring note to end on, and it is exactly 1.30, so I think I will wrap this up now. But Diane, thank you so much for this conversation, and thank all of you for joining us, and um, all right. Adrian, I loved it. Thank you so much for being with me. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.